Welcome back to another episode of the Deer Gear Podcast. I'm your host, Cameron Durr. Thank you for tuning in today. Today's episode, we are continuing to talk about some archery-related items. This is the time of year where I'm get, I'm trying to get my archery system dialed in for the fall. I know I'm focusing heavy on archery in these last couple episodes. There are some more gear-related podcasts coming down the line. I just recorded two really awesome podcast today that are focused on deer hunting equipment so bear with me as we get through the archery conversations today i'm talking to dorge huang of fire knock just me and dorge sitting down solo talking about material property so we're gonna we just focused on broadheads for the last couple episodes and now we're going to talk about materials materials of broadheads materials of blades materials of inserts and materials of the screws on your bow. So we're talking stainless steel, titanium, aluminum, all the different variations and what they mean in the archery world. I learned a lot from this conversation as I do every single time I sit down and talk with Dorge. I hope you guys are as well. Before we get into this conversation, right now is a really special time for us at Exodus. We are celebrating seven years in business. As a company, we know that we wouldn't be where we're at without all of you. So to say thank you, every year in May, we have our anniversary sale. And this year, it is bigger and better than ever. So we're offering a 20% saving on anything on the website. Just use the code YEAR7 on exodusoutdoorgear.com. Go to checkout. Get yourself an Exodus render. YEAR7 in the promo code and you will save 20% on any purchase on the website. So this is the time. Memorial Day weekend is mass deployment for us here at Exodus. So if you're gearing up to get your trail cameras out this fall, this is the best time of year to be purchasing cameras. So save yourself 20%. Thank you guys for all the continued support over the last seven years. If you guys are enjoying any of the content that we're putting out, whether it's from the Exodus podcast, the Deer Gear podcast, the Land podcast, the Exodus YouTube channel, and we also have the Land podcast YouTube channel. So make sure to go check that stuff out. Leave us a rating, comment, thumbs up on any of the content that we are doing. It really helps us out. With that, I will just leave it at thank you guys, and let's get into this week's podcast. All right, everyone. Good morning. Welcome back to another episode of the Deer Gear Podcast. Today, I'm joined solo by Dorge. So Dave's not with us today. It's just me and Dorge sitting down. And we're going to talk a little bit about material properties. Is that correct, Dorge? Yes, I really think so. Like last, last two episodes, we talked about Broadhead. And a few customers just keep on asking me, Dorge, I mean, isn't stainless just stainless? I say, no. Just like motor oil, it's not motor oil. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think this is going to be a good conversation. Um, where do you want to focus this on? Just on materials in general or for well, insert materials? Or I think what, what we need to really go into, I think a lot of people ask the question. And that, that's sort of like a touch on a few subjects since we just finished off on a, on broadheads. And then I, I would like to brush on on most people's concept what broadhead material is best. Okay. And what how come stainless steel is not stainless steel and even on the same number of stainless on a same say a specific series of stainless steel it is not the same and i, I think i need a brush up on it because see i think a lot of people got a misconception just like people say oh it's titanium must be better or it's steel it must be worse or it's aluminium it's soft i mean all those are very i would, I would say misplaced i mean i would like to start with say is stainless broadhead better than aluminum broadhead? First of all, let me just put it this way. No contact cut that I know of in the current market broadhead is aluminum. All the contact surface in the market right now is either steel. And, uh, and in my cases, I got one titanium material broadhead that the contact cutting space is made, is made of titanium. Right on the get-go, when people say stainless steel, I mean, if you look at American metallurgy 
Association on the Stainless Steel. That's about 2030 known to currently used stainless. Like, I mean, I'll just pick up three, which is most used, 303, 304, 420. And uh, 303 is the most used stainless steel because it's easy to machine. 304 stainless, a lot of people prefer it because it don't rust easy. And 420 have a decent property and it's a, um, it's a magnetic property is less. Which, I mean, one of the best way to say it, if, if, let me put it this way. Some people say, oh, uh, steel springs, steel is not hard. If anybody have watched enough TV shows on like making knives, most of the knife, they make it up what spring steel. And then they went through a hardening process. It no longer springs. It becomes like brittle, literally. So I think the metallurgy and approach of metal is where the big problem is. Just like some people say, hey, hey how come different generation of uh, Finox fuel points? Some of them look shiny, some of them not. Well, the process of that, because uh, most of the most of the stainless uh, Fuel point that we at Fine Art make are made of 303. And 303 is not a stainless steel you can harden mm. easily. That means, can it be hardened? Yes. But the process is actually called vacuum and kneeling process. But after you harden it, it'll be a neighborhood of, say, about 40 hardened scale, HRC. What it really does is that in that process of hardening, is that you actually sort of sem put it in a vacuum system so that the surface is now getting vaporized on the very, very surface. And then the molecular realigned, which may give it a super smooth, shiny finish. It is not polished. That's great for stainless. I mean, for a few points, because you look, you start look more like jewelry. You don't have to went through a tumbling process of, or what you call it, a, a polishing process. But that have its downside too, because it at cost. Every time you went through, any uh, metal processing. I mean, the same thing like, it is very easy to protect aluminum using say anodizing. But then anodizing again is a very deep level of science. Like people say the type one, type two, I mean, type two have level one, level two, level three. I mean, it's just like, if you don't know those details, it's close to impossible to even discuss what is that material good? Because you, People really don't want to go into it because it's a very, very disciplined science that not many people want to go in. I would say I'm pretty lucky that I, add, I get to know a few experts and then with their advice and also look at where the industry is going. Because when most people say, oh, give me aluminum, what does that mean? I mean, like, I mean, like in the industry currently, in the old days, we found that aluminum ferro is soft because those guys are using 6061. Well, but if you look deep into it, 6061 is not just 6061. It's 6061, T1, T2, T3, T4, T5, and T6. Well, after you machine it of any of the T, then you can do processing of coating it. The more you coat it, changes property, especially the property you need it altogether, different. I mean, you know, the, the most people do not know, 6061T1 is so soft, you can bite it and it will go down. Oh, wow. Yeah. And then and, and uh, T5 and T6 are what most people machine with. And it's a pretty reasonable property for 90% of the time. That's the reason most people use it for aluminum ferro for, or, or inserts. Is it a good material? I think it really is a very balanced material. Everybody know exactly what it does. It doesn't gauss easily. You can, you can cut with it with machine tool very easily. But you have its downside. Because 6061 tensile string wise, it's about a fifth of a normal steel. When I say steel, I mean blue steel, okay? I mean, not we are talk, not talking Home Depot stainless steel or whatever screw that you bought at Home Depot in the back. Those are junk steel. <laughs> I mean, those numbers you can't even trust. You just need this so that you got something to put in. That I mean, the moment you go into string, they, you, you need to have strikes and dots on them. Otherwise, you do not know what are you buying. That's the reason when we most probably most people, when they talk about stainless, we need to start at least a 303 or 304. Otherwise, you really don't know what you're getting. At that moment, 
it can be as bad as you go to Home Depot and buy. I mean, not <laughs> saying Home Depot school is bad. Home Depot school do what it need to do. It is, but you don't really want to trust it. Sure. I mean, if you just simply use it to hold down your tackle box, I think it's a good good starting point. It's a cheap way to do it. If you want to use it to replace your cam screws, you need to rethink. Probably not. <laughs> yeah. So because are, you, you, mm -hmm. are your um, aluminum inserts or those T five and T six? Yes, some uh, see the final actually in final inserts. Uh, all our dealers, our, our certified and trained dealer, the final C, that the the our destination C means aluminium for the cheap. That's recently oh. sixty sixty one T six. Okay, but our final insert A A for aluminium. Those are actually seventy seventy five. Oh. 7075 have about 82% strength property of 303 stainers, while 6061 is only about a third. Oh, okay. So 7071 is close to a little bit over double. I mean, close to double of what 6061 T6 does. Now, remember, when we say 7075, most people don't understand 7075 T5 is different from T6. So in other words, the higher the T number, the stronger the material. Although the base material is the same, it's simply how you harden it. Okay. The hardening process of a material is defined as realigning how the molecule behaves to give you the tensile strength. And most people talk about tensile strength, there is two numbers that people need to be aware of. One is the ultimate tensile strength. That means that at that time, it literally breaks. The other one is that the time that it elongates and it breaks. Okay. Those numbers are defined based on a certain size. So when you decrease or increase it, that number no longer applies. So engineering of that is also critical. So a lot of times it's like, even in our case, like when we make our first generation of uh, 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 dagger in MIM, which is metal injection molding, now, which is a whole different process. It's actually powdered stainless steel, molded process, and then went through a very, very critical and controlled melting process. So the entire thing will shrink by about two to 3%. But then you can be as precise on weight because you're controlling the density all the way through. But that also created a problem. What happened to the, to the, uh, to the, the, the metal crystallization of the entire process? That's where the hardening come in. But at the same time, when you do metal injection molding, the molecule is not quote unquote linear. In other words, most of the molecules are not pointing in the same direction. Can you do something about it? Yes, you can went through a full heat treatment process or a annealing process that can realign what happened. Now, see, annealing process in most cases is simply we heat the material to a certain stage that the metal just begin to solve and then how fast you got to harden it. I mean, if you are stereophile like myself, you understand um, a, a big crystal copper line cable for a non-large crystal copper cable. I remember the time when I owned stereo saws back in the 1980s. A good set of stereo cable would set me 700 bucks. And whoppers are two bucks a piece. Now whopper <laughs> is over close to five. So you can keep telling you, tell you how crazy this stuff is. And I remember Radio Shack was there. I'm some of my friends just go to Radio Shack and spend five bucks for a speaker set of speaker cable and a spare. And I just spent 700 bucks. <laughs> but then if you don't care and don't know what you're asking for, it's all pointless again. You need to know what you're asking for, what you're getting. As, I, as, what I'm, as my ex, which is one year deaf, stereo is never an issue. She never heard it. <laughs> 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 I mean, it's, it's the same thing with material. And some people case, oh, carbons are, are one-tenth the weight of steel and 10 times as strong. When people say that, in some way it's true and it's wrong. Because when people say carbons are 10 times as strong, are you saying by tensile strength or by weight? Hmm. And both of them are right and both of them are wrong. Because we have not defined how it's being utilized. Yeah, what are you, what are you using it for at that point? Exactly. I, th I think um, we talked a little bit about material properties in the carbon shafts, and you talked yes. a little bit about 
aluminum properties versus carbon properties. And, and I think you even said that your ideal arrow shaft would have been an aluminum shaft, but for like the first 70 shots. And Correct. Then, then hey, by the way, that, that aluminum is 70, 75. Believe it or not. Because that is such a good, a good material. People say, why not? We make it out of titanium. Well, it would be really technically useless because it don't spring back as good. <laughs> titanium so you're, stiff? No, they don't spring back the way that uh, carbon or aluminum does. Okay. Stainless is not bad too, but then the density is too high. So, I mean, in some way that the, the spring back action is what we're looking for in the case of carbon. I mean, let me go back to the, uh, to the aluminum compared to a steel in broadheads. At the end of the day, when we look at a design of a broadhead, is that how much weight do you got to work with? Mm -hmm. I mean, in, my, in most cases, we got 100 grain, right? Right. So where do you, how do you put 100 grain? Well, if you've got a material that is, say, one-fifth the weight, that means you can make that broadhead pretty good size. Yeah, pretty big. Yeah. Right. But then you also lost the uh, uh, ability to have strength because aluminum is really do not, you mean, if you make an aluminum broadhead, it can only be shot once. Because after you cut it, the entire cutting edges are all gone. Sure. Because it doesn't have any, any what you call it, a uh, contact cutting ability. Which the stainless does. Exactly. The stainless, in most cases, stainless steel will do a certain, to be frank with you, the best steel broadhead are made of blue steel. A true blue hardened steel. You know why we didn't use it? It's expensive. No, you'd be sharpened and put in wax and it'd be sharpened every morning before you use it. Oh, geez. Yeah. No Which make it impossible. That. I mean, I mean, I, 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 when I was uh, in, my, in my teenagers, I, I learned from, uh, I actually worked in the Chinese restaurants. For all the guys who are the best in cutting chicken, guess what they use? Those exactly blue steel knife. They were sharpened every single morning to cut chicken. And at the end of the day, every one of them is wiped and then coat the entire thing with peanut oil and then wrapped in a wax paper for tomorrow wow. morning use. What does that because, do? Because it will prevent oxi oxidation. Okay. Because blue steel in raw form oxidize instantaneously. Mm. Of course, if you're cutting it, it doesn't matter. But the moment you stop cutting it, put it on the table within two hours, you got rust spot on the entire Dang. knife. But when you when you ever cut chicken with a blue steel knife once, it's just beautiful. <laughs> are, <laughs> I there mean, broad, I, hmm? are there broadheads out there now that use blue steel? As a matter of fact, there is a field out there. Then those that's the reason you see those broadheads when they come to you, they come with a, a brown wax paper and they got oil on it. Hmm. And they put, I mean, it's not truly blue steel, but closed. They are sharp. You just touch it, it shapes. But the moment you leave it on, on a rainy day, come back, they're no good. The only way you can do it is that you really have to spray some Pam on it and wipe it. <laughs> that's, that's it's just lot. too much work. Yeah. So we need to draw a balance. So the next place, I mean, for people in Alaska and so on, you vote, you find out most of the blade in that kind of form is 403 or 420 stainless. 420 stainless, you can harden it to the point of ridiculous. I mean, I'm saying ridiculous, we are talking over 60 harder than scale. That means it's harder than, I would say, close to 20 or 30% harder than drill bit or dies. Oh, wow. That's what we did on the first generation. That's the, the second generation of our dagger broadheads. But then we also face problems. In that hardness, it gets brittle. Mm -hmm. That means if you shoot that broadhead into, say, cinder blocks, the broadhead is going to find a weaker sling and crack. The bl around the blades? No, on the ferrule. Oh, okay. Because at that moment, just like all impact force, I mean, I remember the, the days that when I used all the ceramic knives for my house, I changed all my hand codes to, to Kyocera. Beautiful stuff. Except uh, when you cut chicken bones with it, you chip the blade. And one mm -hmm. day my wife was cooking and she dropped a tomato sideways on my on my $180 Cairo Sailor knife. It cracked it in half. Cracked the knife in half? Yes. The knife was sitting sideways on the table and the potato just dropped on it. The whole knife just cracked in half. Because it was so hard. Because it's so hard. I mean, a tomato <laughs> cracked the knife. I was like, no! <laughs> that happened! Well, I called Cairo Sailor. He said, did you put any force on the side? 
I said, I did. Tomato drop in it. I said, yep, that would do it. Is it under warranty? Hell no. <laughs> <laughs> because yeah. that was not in 10 years. The in 10 years to go from top to bottom. That's what it was intended. So do you what? ever... Do you ever see mm-hmm. that happen to the fire knock broadheads being that they're stainless? Oh, no, broadhead is stainless. I mean, um, the field tips, the field tips. The field tip is stainless. Our yes. fire knock broadhead is actually 303. Do you ever but see we, that, that happen though? When I, like, with no, the, not the 303. The, see, the 303 have very spring, good spring back capability and 303 is machined. The only time that you have this kind of problem probably happen when it's mimed. Mm. When you mimic, you do not control the direction of the molecule, but you can increase the hardness. Then imagine if the molecules are not realigned perfectly, then they have problems. Okay. So that's the reason, you know, what, what we can go, what we can do is that there's other ways to do it. I so, mean, go ahead. Because see the, 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 um, I personally think the best way to make broadhead, I mean, if money is no object, is a high pressure die cast and then harden. It is just so perfect because mm-hmm. when you do high pressure die cast, you're guaranteed to know the flow of the molecular structure of the broadhead. But the problem is that just like we see in our trauma hawk, in our first and gen, the first gen dagger high pressure die cast, if your mold is 100 per 125 grain, your result is going to be between 120 or the way 132. Mm. Because that's what we got. Yeah. And we get about 25% yield of exactly 125. Hmm. That means every thousand I make, I got 250 perfect 125. And yes. I got 70, that's 120 all the way to 132. That's the reason when you go to our website, we look at the dagger. You see that we sold out everything between the 124 and 127. We got a few of the 120, 20 and 122, and the 128, 29, 30, and 31 left. So it is not ideal as a manufacturer because it literally just quadruple your cost. Yeah, that's that's expensive. That's an expensive process. Yes, and then on the case of MIM. Well, metal injection molding, the best part is that if I make a hot make a thousand. I got a thousand exactly the weight. Yeah, that's nice. And is that cheaper? No, no. Metal injection molding, I mean, give you an idea. Back in the 1984, in order to do a single broadhead in metal injection molding, cheapest place on earth is from India, like Indomim. That will cost you $120,000 on the mold. The price dropped close to, uh, two, uh, close to about four or 500%. But still, you're looking at about 30 grand. That's a lot. For the mold. Yeah. That's and then, of course, you still have the material processing and sharpening. And then, and then after that, you have packaging and advertising on top of it. So it is not a cheap process. But you say, why not just simply like, uh, I would say like one of the best, another good approach is that you machine out a bar stock. Then you know exactly how every single molecule on the crystallization of the broadhead. I mean, like tooth of the arrow. They were machined out of a very, a very precision grinding machine process. So the entire head is exactly the, exactly what it is. But then is that some way you can make the broadhead good? Like the annihilator, one of the good broadhead that used the, the, the three scoop approach, that's a mean process. So it's not a good or bad, it's simply how you approach it and how you, you optimize the design. But just like everything has limitations. I mean, just like, I mean, if you look at the range of that size, it's aluminum on the ferro, but the blades are all German blades. That's the reason it's, it's a, it's, if you want a hundred grain of that length with that wave with cut, that's how you have to do it. Or simply like, look at another company like, uh, uh, say, Iron Wheel. Top to bottom, the ferro is aluminum, the side is stainless. It can be done. I mean, it's simply how you how you utilize the material to your best benefit. Sure. I mean, it's like some people say, oh, titanium is better. Or oh, titanium is worse. I, I think all those numbers, all those statements are loaded. Because yeah. it's like, I think it's more like a political debate. There's no right and wrong answer until you know what the whole content is. And nobody's telling you the whole content. I think that's where the worst part. 
Sure. Yeah. So like we talked a little bit before I made a mistake saying that the titanium is a lighter material. And, and what? That right. Like I was said, oh, titanium is going to save you weight. And yeah. I didn't, I didn't say as opposed to carbon or as opposed to aluminum or anything like that. So you, you kind of corrected me a little bit there. Let's talk a little bit about that. Yeah. I mean, just like, can carbon be heavier than, than aluminum? <laughs> Believe me not, you can. Depends on how you use it and how you use it for. If you need carbon as an impact force or impact contact its own, you're going to use a lowest grade carbon with the highest uh, rate resin and even add fiberglass in it in order to say you want to make a hammer out of, say, carbon. Then you're yeah. going to need a ton of resin, a ton of fiberglass to make it work. Because the moment when carbon hit impact on a solid impact, carbon is going to crush. Yeah. So at that moment, the carbon hammer is going to be a lot more, it's about to be equal, heavy, and, and larger in mass than, say, a steel, a significant amount in mass. But then can you make, I mean, then you look at, a, say, a, a sludge, uh, and we say a, a rubber hammer with steel ball or lead ball in it. Those are called dead hammers. When they hit you, there's no bruise, but you just have internal damage. <laughs> <laughs> so this is where I think a lot of times, I mean, the general rule is that um, I would say, imagine it's by weight and density. People need to know this. Pure weight. One, uh, one pound size of steel, if it's made of titanium, is 45% lighter. If it's made of aluminum, it's only about, 80, it's 85% lighter. It's made of carbon. It's going to be about 5 to 7% of the weight of the steel in the same identical volume. Okay. Okay, now, just like people say strength, strength is really a really loaded question. Strength in what way? Compression? Mm. Bending? Crushing? Or load? So imagine I have a one, say, one foot long stainless steel rod. See, stainless steel rod is not the same as stainless steel tube. They are two different things. <laughs> stainless steel rod will bend before a stainless tube does. Why? Because, see, they will crush. A stainless steel tube will bounce back. Oh, uh, okay. The rod That's the reason. Crush. Correct. Because you start crushing on the bottom. That's the reason the larger the tube size, the more it have ability to, to bounce back and recover on the same size. Remember, we talked about uh, carbon, uh, carbon arrows, mm -hmm. but then the critical part is that when you reach a certain point, it no longer works the way you need to be, which is also why 166 in the size of an arrow, which we usually run about 300 and 400 grain complete, is not as good so on the same identity 400 grain arrow you are better off getting a 300 ID shaft, the size of a go 22 over a 166 and 300 spine. Can, one, can 166 be better at 300 in some occasion? Answer is yes. Depends on how you load your bow, how fast your bow shoots, how fast the arrow recovery. Again, we are talking material science and how to utilize it. People say, well, you know, 166 is no good. No, 166 is not no, no good for all conditions, but it's great for some conditions. Like when you shoot recurve, 166 is fantastic. But then people say, well, what's the big deal? The big deal is that building 166, again, we're talking material science. It's not just graphite, because graphite in, and, and it's a pretty new technology. Of course, they got a whole more new stuff coming out, like the graphene sheets and so on, the nanofibers and so on, and nanotubing fibers. I mean, we're talking a whole new four or five different generation, just like the Aramid stuff. I mean, that's another chunk that people haven't even touch yet, because those stuff would just give you unbelievable stuff. But then to work with them costs a lot of money. Oh, yeah. Can you, I mean, can it be made? Yes, answer to this, yes. But can you, do you want to spell $1,200 on a dozen arrow? No way. That's special. Yeah, no so, way. So, and, and how much do you able to benefit from it? I mean, just like basic graphite stuff. People say graphite. Remember the first usable graphite when it first came out was actually in, in carbon fiber will be back in the 1970s. The first company who use it is Abu Ghazia using Don Abu Conolloy. 
those are simple graphite impregnated sheets. And they are not very good. But compared to, compared to fiberglass, they are better. And people say, well, didn't we, didn't we use that for carbon arrows? No, we did not. The first time of carbon arrows are all extruded and they are not high grade carbons because we read rhino resins. So this is where a lot of problems, just like people strict, like, the, like the, the situation with the string bump. As I say, carbon would be the worst, but it worked. Why? <laughs> Your string did not hit the carbon string bump. The string it's hit the a rubber. chunk of rubber first. Sure. And just simply, I mean, this, I'm not doing a commercial, but the fact is that at this moment, there's nobody deal with vibration material better than Slim Saver. Gary and Steve seem know what they're doing. I mean, that's the reason all my stuff is all them safer stuff because their vital material is just so good. I mean, they got that, they, I mean, it's, they got it down to a science. That, I mean, if somebody do it that good, you don't use it, you're just cutting yourself short for no yeah. reason. Sure. I mean, can, is that cheaper material out there? There is plenty of them. I know some people say, I will cut a, I will cut a chunk out of my old tires and put it on. It's, it's no joke. It makes sense because it's in a similar material, but the word is similar, but yeah. not exact. That's where the science come in. I, I mean, I, I always keep and say, Dodge, you make so much titanium. Why not? It's so great. Why are you running out of cam? That was stupid. <laughs> because see, titanium is 300% heavier than aluminium. Oh, you can just machine the hell out of it. That is a bit, that's a valid, uh, that's a very valid uh, uh, suggestions. But how much you want to pay for it? Yeah, really. You know, when you machine titanium, it is about 10, uh, about 10 times. That means if you got a machine CNC.2, if you were able to do 100, quote unquote, stainless 303, you only do about 10 in the, in the GL5. So your tool wear is over 900%. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, that's expensive. <laughs> yep. Then we're talking about, it is not just material, it's the tooling part. We say, well, can't you just die cast it and then machine? Absolutely. But the minimum order quantity goes sky high. <laughs> <laughs> you see, so, there's always a balance and most people just, I mean, can it be done? Yes. How many do you need? <laughs> yeah, yeah. How, how many can you have? Right. There's a cost associated with all that. Right. I mean, just like the guy from Kiev, they make the they make their bowl out of a like carbon fiber sheets, but then it's reasonable cheap. You can water cut it, but then they spend so much money in assembly. I mean, think about it. A normal crossbow got about sixty screws. The Kiev got over two hundred. Oh wow. If you have to put 200 screw together, imagine you sit there, lock tight drop, and then tighten. Because remember, if you tighten it too much on a carbon, you crack it. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. you just like, I mean, you need to look at the whole thing and say, well, then go back to the say, why, why, why we find out make a titanium screws? I think that's a question that a lot of people ask. What's the big deal? Is, if it's only what, 45% reduction? But that is a 50% closer to what the entire bowl, which is aluminum, is. And you reduce the, the, not vibration, the resonance. See, vibration is pretty high. Resonance is higher. That frequency is what robs. I mean, again, if you only shoot something normally like a 260, 70 feet per second, most of what I talk about really don't matter. Sure. It only matters when you start passing that 300 and then really become a big deal at 315. But look at it. Don't like this year when Expedition come up with a smoke. That's a 370 feet per second. That will match what the PSC full throttle does back in 2017 or 16. That bow hit like a hammer in the hand when you shoot it. But then how come Expedition don't? Very simple. Machine the hell out of it. If there's no mass, it's hard to create vibration, isn't it? Sure. Well, that's look at the size, look at the shape of the cam. It's all skeletonized to the bejesus. <laughs> and then you look at 
quote unquote, the Matthew camp is a very solid mass in the middle. Can you help that more with it? Absolutely. That's the reason it's a big deal for the Matthew camp to change the Excel, which besides APA, that's the only bowl that we're going to offer that. And we may offer the, the titanium Excel for the, uh, for the, what's the, Darton. Because Darton have a quarter inch Excel in it. When you start going that, that's a lot of weight. Yeah. I mean, can you imagine that, that you simply have a steel rim compared to aluminum rim? If they are the same shape, same size, you just knock 45% weight of the, uh, of the steel. But then when aluminum depends on how you use it and based on design, in other words, design, you can design something to match it. Just like if you look at a stool, which is the easiest thing. Look at the stool that you step on that's made by Mubbermaid. And look at the stool in the old days that made of steel. Not a single part looks the same, but, but the function is the same. And the steel is most probably about twice as heavy as the plastic. But if you want to throw that thing out of a street store building on the ground, the plastic will survive and the steel will be all banged up. Yep. But if you roll it over a truck, the plastic will be deformed and bounce back, the steel will be crushed. Yeah, yeah, it's all on the application. That's all on Exactly. LOT. It's all on the application. And the application is such a big deal. I mean, just like Broadhead. Oh, this, I mean, if you've got identical design, okay? Money, no object. Identical design. Whatever you work in steel, usually will work better in titanium with a 45% reduction in weight. Say that again for me. I mean, to... I say if you've got an application in steel that is working very good, and you use the identical process and made it out of titanium, you are able to drop the weight by easily forty-five percent and maintain nearly everything you wanted. The only thing you may lose is the the super hardness of the steel because you can anneal it, mm -hmm. and the titanium you could not. So, so that's the reason. Mm -hmm, go ahead. So the you have a titanium broadhead, correct? Correct, a titanium dagger, which is let me just say, just like a one hundred and twenty-five dagger. I just use this identical design and I mold it in titanium. That actually costs from one hundred and twenty-five grain to eighty-five grain, oh. and the titanium in in most cases work better than the steel. People say, well, wait a minute, you just lower the FOC. Work better in the high level of compound bows because yes. all of a sudden. You get the benefit of the mass, the structure, but you don't have the weight. So the spine reaction is better and the flight characteristic is better. So what about um, cutting with stainless and titanium? What's the... Uh, I would there? say the stainless, you know, there's another one, stainless and titanium. What's stainless? How hard, what is the hardening process? 420 you stainless. 420 stainless. And then the next question is, how do you harden it? If I to say 53 chassis, oh my God, that would be just wonderful. The problem is that you now, after every cut, you pretty much, you won't be able to sharpen it mm. because it's too brittle. No and it's not, you're going to worth sharpening because it, if you look at the chip, very tip of that, every time you sharpen, you just get chipping it mm -hmm. because it's closer to ceramics. I mean, yes, can aluminum cut and be used for a cutting blade? Yes, you can do that. How? Harden it, never uh, anodize it using the type two level three. It will behave like ceramic. But then the moment you finish cutting it, the, the, all the tip will be chipped. Just like imagine you make ceramic broadheads. Oh, this is a good subject. Do you know that? Uh, I just got exposed to this. There is ceramic out there that have the same property as boulders that you can literally throw the ceramic into into cinder blocks and boulders, it will not crack. What? Yes. <laughs> We're going to see that in a few years, and I will just reserve that for now. <laughs> I'm going to keep that. You've got ceramic, which is about now another 30% reduction in weight compared to titanium. But remember, it is not meant for cut yet. <laughs> <laughs> because ceramic, ceramic is a clay. The process of high-level ceramic is very close to carbon fiber constructions. Just so I'll give you a hint. <laughs> this is fun stuff. I mean, because see, all of a sudden, and, and, and people really need to rethink material science because the moment something is bad, 
because of the current material, just by changing the design a slightly, or, or not design slightly, or material slightly approach, the result is just night and day. I mean, it's really, it's unbelievable. That's the reason people say, well, why come I pay so much material for a next grade of material of the same class? Because it's worth it. If you know, if you desire that result, but then just remember, there's always a give and take. If you want that, what are you giving up? In most cases, price. Price is not of just material itself. The process, the control, the development, they all have to be paid. When you when somebody paying it, the price goes up. There's just no way around it. Sure. I mean, like, I mean, I, I, I was so thrilled to understand it from Professor Cornwell about the like, titanium. I mean, I never thought about it until they point out, hey, this is pretty much no, look at the titanium hammer process. I mean, you take half, I mean, you take the same amount of effort, but at the end of the day, it doesn't hurt you. Now you can work all day. I mean, I remember the time when I first read the article back in the 1980s. A normal guy with a, say, a, a, a steel frame hammer, usually your 20, the 24 ounces, by the day four of framing, his shoulder is gone. And Friday, he was just toughing through it. And Saturday, he had got an ice pack on his shoulder. And then Monday, he go through all over again. Now he paid 200 bucks, 250 bucks for a titanium hammer, which is 16 ounces to the same framing. At the end of Friday, his arm is fine. He can go fishing on Saturday. So is the 250 worth it? <laughs> I'd say so. <laughs> exactly. So what's the difference? The difference is that titanium will provide the same amount of force over area on impact force. But after you finish hammer that moment, the vibration that come back is 80 to 90% less. Can it be done in other ways? Absolutely. Look at, uh, look at uh, Black and Decker. They did, a, they did a good job on the hammer. They put, uh, they put a multiple Z in the metal and then put Z vomit in the metal on the, on the handle and then put a fiberglass and then rubber, put a rubber on it and fiberglass on it. So they are using different approach of the material and other material to prevent the shop from coming back. It's cheaper, it's 70, 80 bucks, but you're still swinging at 24 ounce. So there, you save eight ounces of weight with the titanium as well. Co correct. That's a big deal, you know. Sure, yeah. I mean, that's a third of it. Mm -hmm. But don't have other issue? Yes. The, uh, the metal inside the time can go and see because it may have steel, have internal crack. But of course, in most cases, I mean, you figure that if the, the lifetime of a titanium hammer, say, assuming it's five million, and the, and the steel is, say, million two. So you end up to be about the same. But you say, I got to use a new hammer three times. <laughs> well, some people like new stuff. Yeah. Let's relate this back to archery. So mm -hmm. with the titanium kit, that you offer the titanium bolts and mm -hmm. the titanium arrow bump. Mm -hmm. uh, what are the benefits to using titanium over the stock screws? First of all, a lot of people, they, they, they look at specs differently. They look at, say, say on the case of your Matthews V3 X. If you put a titanium screw kit on it, it only dropped away by two ounces. You should not be able to feel two ounce difference, right? Right. But you do. You do. <laughs> you do. And you say, well, two ounces worth over a hundred something dollars. It should not make a difference, right? But it does. It does. <laughs> it does. And people say, oh, no, no, you can't be shooting five inch higher by just using titanium and spring bump. The titanium spring bump can't possibly do all this. Titanium spring bump alone did not do that. The titanium spring bump and the steel screws together did it. What it did is that it changed the resonance of the bow. Now, people need to understand that. Compared to the older days, both, the today's bows are more potential energy optimized. In other words, the upper and lower can theoretically cancel each other. Theoretically. You already need to, just even if we match it down to the grain, it still be no good. Do you know why? I don't. Because the limbs are never, ever, ever perfect. So there's always a minute difference. And 
look at our boats and camps today. Today's are all the camps and the boats itself, even when you fully relax it, is it relaxed? No, no it is under extreme under pressure. pressure. Correct. So we're moving from one stage of the loaded energy to another stage. So that from that stage to other stage, when you're finished, the vibration is the difference of the cams itself and the difference of limb itself, but that's another set of higher frequency vibration. It's called the resonance. That is what robbed the arrow of energy. Hmm. Now, I want you to imagine this. In the old days, at 200, and the low speed, 260, and so on, the arrow pretty much comes out. The arrow goes is basic parabolic action. You go into what you call the artery paradox, and the arrow goes reasonable, a tight electrical spin, and it goes out. Now, with the new high let off, high stage, uh, potential stage change, in other words, like your, your, all your 80% of our bows. The moment you shot it, you notice that the frequency in the sound is much higher. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, most people notice that. That is what's given to the to the arrow too. So the arrow, besides its basic uh, your your basic parabolic action, you also have micro flex in it. Mm -hmm. That was given from the bow. Well, guess what? That micro flex it takes energy to calm down, but it right. takes a lot more in the initial stage. That means that arrow for the first 30 yards is having that micro flex in it. That's the reason the moment you put a titanium kit on at 40 yards, you usually see one to two to three inches difference just by putting titanium in it. Because it's recovering and quicker. Because the arrow do not have to deal with the micro flex. The recovery time is not different. It's that there's a second stage inside uh, the arrow that is oh. eating up the energy. It's not eating it. I'm following now. See, the microflex is where a lot of people are not understanding. The microflex is a lot worse in the 166 compared to the 300 size. I mean, the worst part is that you can't even see that in quote unquote high speed camera at 15,000 RPM because the microflex is within one or two millimeter of the shaft itself because it's called microflex. How can you find this? <laughs> Everybody who that is good can because the first person who actually find this out for me is Sir Rod White, the Olympic gold medalist. He found it through feet per second difference. Oh, you put a titanium kit on it at forty yards. That's about eighteen feet per second difference on the chill at twenty nine inch, uh, twenty nine inch draw third uh, seventy pound. That is only two ounce difference in weight. How come the arrow hit close to four, 12 to 14 feet per second difference? It's not losing as much energy. Correct, because of the microflex. I mean, I tried to find it and look at it through my high speed camera. I can't see it. But something is doing it because otherwise there won't be that 12 to 14 feet per second difference. Yeah, where'd that come from? Right. Especially when you two test the damn thing on bear shaft. And so then, you know there's, there's no thing in it. But it's, I think it's important to say, too, that at the point of launch, you're not going to see that difference. It's just no. going to be going to be Correct. Your range. feet per second is not going to be different on launch. That's the reason a lot of people say, oh, my God, I used this. I lost one. Oh, another thing. On your, speed, on your string bump, the position of the string bump is so critical. I learned that with the scorpion. Just by putting a string bump to... Two millimeter in front of spring bump, two millimeter preload it, after low it, let it buy. It can be feet per second difference, but you also change the vibration. So in other words, feet per second is not your only number. You need to see how the both behave. Because if you put a spring bump, in the case of a skull put, uh, that moment we are testing on the, the uh, no, testing on the, uh, not, not the Orion, after the Orion, it, the, the Oculus. By giving in an extra three, uh, close to three millimeter, the arrow was close to three feet per second faster. But the sound is louder. The recovery mm -hmm. is longer. So you gain the feet per second, but you lose the feet per second later. Downer. If I put it earlier, I also lose feet per second. But the arrow, the arrow seems to be cleaner because the vibration never starts. But if I put it right about and then put back and forward, I would say just about one millimeter before the string totally settled. In other words, the string bump is about a millimeter 
before the string. That seems the most ideal. Now, that is on a scorpion. Oculus, it is not true. I mean, it is, I mean, I did the same thing with the uh, uh, PSC Preformix. Preform is different. It's a long draw bow. The string bump is critical on the, on the high side. So the, the closer to the center, the better of you are. But again, the closer the center and so on, how is how when the, when, when the string finally hit, how is the vibration of the string? In other words, it's just like, imagine the string is like a guitar string, but guitar string don't move up and down. The entire bow string does because when the cam move the plane of the string differently. So it is not just simply a triangle, but a moving triangle you're dealing with. <laughs> See, most people just don't understand. They say, oh, uh, uh, it's not a guitar. No, a guitar two end do not change. Right. The bow string does. Yeah. <laughs> and and the, and the, the remember, it is not just the uh, two anchor points. And on top of that, the triangle of the bow that comes out is not the same. Because remember, when you pull the bow back, you don't, you're not just shrinking the edge, the point to point triangle, you're also elongating it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Does the titanium kit make the bow any quieter? Oh, absolutely. See, this is where the resonance control comes in because the titanium by its characteristic is going to absorb 70, 80, 90% of property alone, identical. In that specific application, you should see a 70% difference if you just change the, uh, on each of the boat's characteristic. Remember, the one on the limb boat is different from the one on the cam boat, it's different from the one on the limb pocket boat, depends on where you put it and how you do it. That's the reason we have found out we use two different materials, GL2 and GL5. The moment we need it to hold without moving, that will be GL5. Okay. The moment we are afraid that you can strip some because GL5 is very hard, like your cam marks and so on, we use GL2. But in the case of like the Hoyt cable post hold, that had to be GL5. Because there's a lot of torque and tension, it's close to the center. You need the strength, brass can snap. But then at the same time, the GL5, we do not recommend hollow. In the case of when the, uh, when the bow design do not have a bell, bell nut or the bow have a tendency to, to twitch on the limb pocket, like the Elite. Mm -hmm. So for elite, especially on the older one, we tell them go solid, don't go hollow, because the moment you twitch right the left and right with pitches, guess what? You crack the titanium. Mm. So I mean, have a solid, solid board. all right. But then we also need to understand how come in titanium there's no torque specs because titanium is too snug. In in the most case of steel, we are now dealing with the ultimate tensile strength because see when you start tightening steel, you're also pulling the steel using the pullback, right? Sure. In the GF titanium, there's no pullback. The moment you break it, you break it. Mm. Okay. So you... see, this is kind of material that really drive people crazy because it's not that simple. <laughs> yeah. And not to mention, we got a huge problem with titanium able to gauss. And people say, oh, I mean, if anybody in hot, in, into hot rodding will know titanium, quote unquote, uh, uh, a piston, piston rod is fantastic. No, it's not fantastic. <laughs> you need to put a shed load of uh, lubrication material, just like the titanium piston rod must put on the side, you must have brass on the side, most probably oil impregnated brass, and you need to put the, your, 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 your major bearings has to be in brass or not, a really good brass. And the lubrication would be crazy. And the piston ring on the side, you now you have to put brass spacers. You know why? Because if you let the titanium touches, quote unquote, your, your camshaft, or you touch the inside of your piston ring, guess what? You'll gauss. Yeah, that is, that is a frustrating material. <laughs> it is, but the fact is that the moment you understand how it works, it really is beautiful. Yeah. I mean, why do you think Infinity, all the, all the latest high-end Infinity works so good? The, the, because the valve opened faster. Did they use titanium? No. They use ceramic. <laughs> ah. Now you know why we, I mean, the moment we understand it, just like, you know, in our era, uh, I use a lot of ceramic because ceramic, I mean, ceramic is not ceramic. Ceramic is a class of material that's super hot, super lightweight. And people say, oh, ceramic is heavy. Well, depends on what ceramic. It's the same thing I can claim carbon is heavy. 
what what carbon? How do I use it? Yeah. So um, are we able to, at this point, like kind of break down the different materials used for broadheads, inserts, um, bow, bolts, and kind of go through like the benefits and- Oh, of course, definitely. I mean, when you say one, I will say the pros and cons. Okay, so we'll start with the insert. So if you had a brass insert in your era, what would be the benefits of, or pros and cons of brass? Okay, brass is cheap. So brass is, now brass is not cheap, in other words. I know it's always difficult, so two-way to it. <laughs> because there's, I mean, commonly, commonly available there's 30, 30 something brass. Machine brass, or even pregnant brass, and junk brass, they are not the same, okay? Brass is, first of all, an alloy, because brass is an alloy of copper to start with. So when you do say, when we say machine brass, it's what we use in most, mostly we use in uh, uh, inserts. What you get is that for half the price of stainless, you've got the same density and weight, which now increase your front of center. That may be good for some people, okay? That will increase the momentum of your arrow. And it's not also not pricey. That's the benefit of brass. So in some printing stainless at twice the price, you put brass will give similar benefit, but brass will deform compared to stainless faster. Okay. So for insert, brass is a good insert if you're thinking of hunting, but it is not a good insert if you're for practice because it will deform as time goes on. So the more you shoot it. Correct. Okay. Then say aluminum insert. Again, aluminum is aluminum, 60, 61, and 70, 75. We assume that when we talk 60, 60 is T6, 70, 75 is T5. With that too, the 70, 75 is better because it deforms less. But if 75 is no good if you hunt a lot because 70, 75 will corrode a lot more faster than 60, 61. But when you anodize it, they will be, then you got all the benefit. But remember, aluminum is one fifth the weight of stainless. So that for target shooters or people who prefer a heavier broadhead, and still lower the not go crazy on the front of center, aluminum is better. So because it's a little bit lighter, but still no, it's the... significantly lighter. It's one fifth. But then it depends on what the design is. I mean, like in the two forty six, the insert is going to be eighteen grain. But in the in the two hundred four, the insert is going to be on stainless. It's going to be closer to uh, 50, 60 grains. So what would be the benefit of using a stainless insert then? The stainless insert, you've got multiple benefits, but you also got a downside. First of all, it's durable. In stainless, in most cases, we use 304 stainless because 304 stainless have very good corrosion resistant. That means it's a long-term insert. But then it depends on the design because you can make stainless less, make it smaller, and still have all the benefit but then your total contact surface is less, so you can pull out easily. Mm, but if okay. you're using aero concept, it doesn't matter. You got a full carbon tube on it. <laughs> sure. Yeah. See, see, everything have its two sides. You need to start look at it. When people say just on one material, you can never answer the right question. Right. Answers for what under what condition? For what application? Yep. Mm -hmm. Do you offer a titanium insert? I do. I mean, in the case of uh, the two hundred four, we offer actually titanium expression in two hundred four. And in case of the three, uh, 315 size, we also offer the titanium. The reason for that in the, in the 315, because titanium is so hard, we actually use that and make it our destroyer series. Imagine oh, yeah, when you got yeah. so hard, when you saw somebody got two arrows in the 11 ring, you push your arrow there, you crack them both. Sure. But then in the case of a 204, we use titanium insert because the titanium insert gives you the best balance. Okay. But then you, you got killed on price. I, I mean, say. the... The stain, the aluminum is twenty. It's twenty dollars. The titanium is eighty bucks. Yeah, that's a that's a big difference. The no, seventy bucks. That's a that's a big difference. Yeah. But then, if you buy titanium insert, the good thing is that it's a lifetime insert because, unlike aluminum, when you recover, it's junk. Yeah. The titanium you can burn everything, burn the air out, and just like a stainless steel, you buy it once, you use it for the rest of life as long as you don't change arrow size. Okay. So, from moving on to like the broadheads. Mm -hmm. um, the, I, I'm not very educated on the different materials different companies use for broadheads, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. the broadhead that I shoot is 7075 mm -hmm. on, the, on the ferrule. Mm -hmm. And the, the blades are stainless. Mm -hmm. Most 40, probably 420 hardened. 420 stainless. Yep. Is that, uh, what are the different 
materials you can use for blades. And what the blades is actually the 420 stainless is a is Excel is actually a trap, a trap of claiming, because 420 stainless can be as low HRC as 10 all the way to 60 something. It's uh, the hardening process. Yeah. Because then you, based on the there. design and what you need to do, you now need to draw a balance. Just like we, I learned on the on the 53 HRC on my dagger, it's no good. I need to drop it to 42. Too hard. But then, yep. But then if you make it thin enough, the material can flex. You can afford to harden it further. Mm. So the thickness and also the material and how it's functioned. For example, if you've got a blade that's thicker, not, uh, not wider, but thinner, you can afford to harden, to harden it more okay. compared to a blade that's thicker and, and, uh, uh, and, and shorter sure. in profile. That itself is where the hardening can help. So in other words, if the company, whoever engineer, engineer this, understand this, there is really no wrong way to do it. Okay. No, I, mean, I, I would say that there's only one best way to do it. But there is thousands of wrong way to do it. Yeah, and, and and unfortunately, most people don't look into it. So that's the reason you find out the original original design of that specific broadhead is always the best. Yeah, the multiple difference in design from that point onwards, since they usually settle on one specific material design thickness hardening, as they change deviate their design, the stuff getting worse. Sure. Is there exception to accept that rule? Absolutely. We have to know there's great engineer out there. Unfortunately, in the archery industry, that's not most people don't have the background or desire to find the best person and ask the right questions. Right. They always ask uh, what's the cheapest way to do it. <laughs> that's a hundred percent. Which is a shame. I mean, it, it's really so sad. Just like you know, some broadhead that was come up with that's great. Then you see the second and third generation, they sort of sucked in a very big way. Went cheaper. They went, they went cheaper way. They, they said, well, it's selling. Then they lost a lot of its original ability and original design character criteria, and they deviate from that. Yep. And it's very frustrating. Yep. Um, so with aluminum, you have the two we talked about here are 6061 and 7075. You said 6061 T6 which 6061 is a softer aluminum, correct? Yes. You no, know, a 60 is a, it's a, it's a less hard material. Okay. The 7075 is pretty much close to three times as hard. And then you have T6, which is even harder. The hardest of the, of the 6061. And then because T5. it's hardened compared to T5, T3, T2, T1. T1 sure. is so soft that you can bite it. Sure. And then T5 on the 7075 is... Which is, uh, which is what equivalent. Because remember, we also look at what's available. Yep. The 7071 T6 and 7071 T... The 6061 T6 and 7075 T5 is, is readily available. Yep. And most people know how to work with it. Okay. Because when you work with different material, then your entire CNC machine programming can be totally different. Your two feet time can be different. And it causes all the issues. Because your cost structure is different again. Yep. And then when you move on to your bow... And you, you, when you do the uh, titanium kit, you have not only the bolts on the bow, but you have the sight screws, and you oh, have yeah. the rest, the screws for the rest. What's right. the what's the benefit to changing those? Because bolts? those are just so obvious. And then uh, every bow have a sight. And every bow have a. In the old days, every bow have the AMO AMO's uh, standard. Your ten twenty four on the sight screw, and your five sixteen twenty four on the uh, 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 on the air rest. I mean, those are for sure what you do, but most of the customer who really want it and really want to get the bill's benefit, we offer them a service. They usually send the site to me and I actually change all the screws on the site. I mean, just like, most people never believe it. Let's say a Spock Hawk, Hawk father, have about, after about close to five ounces of site screws on it. Wow. So imagine if you take, put it into titanium, you're dropping two ounces on the site. What does that mean? Remember, your site is pushing forward. Yep. Your stabilizer bar on the back just dropped three ounces. Mm, yeah. You're holding not six ounces less with the same result. <laughs> and not to mention, the titanium on it is not focused. Remember, when what everything you deal with you said is angular momentum. Imagine your, your, what your hand is grabbing. The distance from your hand 
to that specific screw. That's what you're doing. And every single one of them out there. And okay. every one of them shakes. Yeah, right. The higher the level of the bow, the worse it vibrates. Because we're dealing resonance. The more you give back to the arrow. <laughs> so I mean, every, it's, every additional screw you switch out to titanium, the, the more energy. The, the one that has least amount of effort, it will be the quiver. Because you don't, unless you shoot with the quiver on. Right. But the guy with a with the bow mount quiver, like the new Matthew Ultralight, or the guy who shoot the, you say, uh, tight point, okay? Those are so critical because the entire vibration is on the same linear plane of your bow. Of the bow, yeah. You actually cause the bow to swing left and right with those quivers. Because, yeah. yes, they are easier to hold, but at the same time, you also got a lot harder to maintain. Mm -hmm. Most people don't understand. The titanium screw on the actual shooting condition, say on the... Uh, uh, on the Apex 7, which is what we, we tested with originally, the titanium screw gives you about a quarter of a second more earlier for target acquisitions. It may not sound like a lot. When you only have a couple seconds. Well, but in the case of a hunting bow, say on uh, uh, the one that we, we originally tested with Rock White is on, a G, on, a, on the 2014 chill. He said that he can feel that he can acquire about the target about quarter half to a quarter second faster. Okay, now you need to ask yourself this question: How much is that worth to you? In See. most cases, I told people it's hard to tell you. You need to shoot your current bow for about a month first to get know to know exactly what they do, and have somebody maybe. I mean, in case you tried that already, I mean, a lot of people say I feed you Kool Aid. <laughs> yeah, someone said I had. <laughs> <laughs> I would tell them, do the same thing with what I have. Shoot your bow for one month or a few weeks, swap out the stuff, close your eyes and shoot it again. It is a real deal. This is real science. This is, if it's Kool-Aid, I won't be doing it in my age after my retirement. <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough. Is there anything else you want to cover here? No, I think we got quite a few. I think a lot of people got a lot of questions and then shoot it our way and then we'll try our best to explain. Because a lot of things, I tell people, don't trust what I said. Get what I have, play with it. I offer you a 30-day unconditional. You can't go wrong with it. You're yeah. talking eight bucks, 10 bucks to send it back to me and then you don't owe me anything. Yep. If it's not good, send it back. I don't want you to keep it. It is freaking black and white on my warranty page. It's on every one of my catalog. If that's not good enough, I'm not asking you to trust me. It is by law, okay? <laughs> yeah, I think that's fair enough. Well, I look forward to our next conversation. I'm going to go out here on my lunch break and I'm going to shoot my bow a little more because <laughs> it's that enjoyable to shoot. So <laughs> I'm glad. I'm glad. <laughs> we'll, we'll oh, have a wonderful day. We'll leave it there. Yes, sir. Goodbye. <laughs>